So, um, hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Sarah Abbott MW and Belinda Stone to cover today's webinar all about old vines. So Sarah, some of you will know because she's presented um, for us on Georgia before. Um, if you don't know her, I'll just um, quickly introduce Sarah and Belinda. So um, Sarah is um, very experienced in the wine trade, joined the wine trade in 1996. Um, and uh, her core wine training was around Bordeaux, Burgundy and Barolo, but um, she's also got a great passion for the new frontiers of wine. So she ad she advises for the National Wine Agency of Georgia, has done for the last five years, and also runs the UK Market Development Programme for Georgian Wine um, in the UK. And like I say, some of you will know Sarah from the fantastic webinar that she did for us on Georgian Wine. Um, she passed the MW in 2008 and is still quite actively and heavily involved with the uh, uh, the student program, having run the second year course days um, uh, for a couple of years. She's also one of only six committee judges at the um, uh, International Wine and Spirits competition, which um, many of you will know. Um, after 10 years of working for wine importers, Sarah founded Swell, her own business, back in 2006. And Swell delivers marketing strategy and activation for wine producers and trade bodies from France, Italy, Turkey, Georgia, and Japan. Um, but most recently, in 2021, she founded the Old Vine Conference, which is um, what you'll be hearing about uh, at today's webinar. So Sarah will run the kind of the bulk of the presentation. Um, and then after the Q&A, um, Belinda will be here to talk us, to tell us a little bit more specifically about the work that the Old Vine Conference does. So um, Belinda Stone has worked um, in the wine shed for more than 20 years, but she has more of a marketing background. So although she has the diploma, she's also one of very few chartered marketeers in the wine trade. Um, she's worked with some of the world's leading brands and UK importers, but today she's responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the Old Vine Conference. Um, and the design and execution of the annual campaign program to create a global category for old vine wines. So Sarah and Belinda, a very warm welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Thanks, so um, Sarah, if you're ready, I'll hand over the reins and you can get sure. going and we are, we're ready when you are and I'll pop back up for the Q&A at the end. So over to you, Sarah. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to dive straight in. I just want to express how grateful I am that you've given up your time and that you're curious to learn more about Old Vines. So um, the Old Vine Conference was a side gig. Um, we co-founded as a non-profit Back in 2021, like a lot of people, we found ourselves with a little bit more downtime um, at that time of, uh, of our lives. And the aim of the non of the Old Vine Conference is to bring together a global network to basically build a category, recognizing the very high value in all senses of wine from old vines, from heritage vineyards. And we do this by holding conferences, connecting, educating, and really seeking to inspire the global wine trade to make sure that the amazing wines that can be made from these vineyards are not basically removed from potential existence because the vineyards are lost, because their value cannot be realized in the final wines. These are vineyards that take a lot of care, agricultural know-how and craft in order to cultivate, but the rewards are high, as I hope to be able to explain as we go through the presentation. So why do we care about old vines? I think that old vines have a muse effect. Great old vineyards attract some of our most talented winemakers from all over the world, even if it's not always a key selling point of a particular wine that it has come from old vineyards, but they are a beacon definitely for talent um, in terms of creative winemaking talent. When you get this intersection at its best of a heritage vineyard, great winemaker, great terroir, and this long kind of cultural in and agricultural interweaving, you have some of the most exciting, distinctive and delicious wines that certainly you'll ever try. There's 
more to old vines though because the genetic material of ancient varieties which is always retrieved from forgotten old vineyards or perhaps um, vineyards that have maybe gone through almost a little bit of benign neglect that material has already proved vital in adapting to climate change and there are significant projects now taking place in Spain, Argentina, Australia and Portugal on projects like this. Um, taking cuttings from these ancient varieties, getting them identified, going through trials and in many cases having that um, variety propagated and reintroduced for production. The Australians call this heritage clones, and I think that's a really nice term. The economic and social relevance of old vines is embedded into very rural, traditional agricultural communities. And I think that the old vine lens is a way of cracking open the agricultural heart of wine in a way that makes what can seem a very technical or opaque side of wine it makes it really human and, and real. However, there is a, a sort of a structural inertia against these old vines in many parts of the world actually being able to make their way in terms of the price that's paid for the fruit. And as we go through this presentation, I'm going to tell you a bit about all the different initiatives around the world that are going on and how they all aim to basically ensure that the increased input know-how time that is required to farm these old vineyards is represented and rewarded in the price paid for the fruit and therefore ultimately the price paid for the wine. And finally, I'm going to talk about how we have a stock of very valuable, healthy old vineyards of cultural resonance and genetic diversity that are being lost and being lost actually at, at a pretty rapid rate because they can't be made to pay. And one of our aims within our network and within all the amazing partners that we work with is to halt this because this is a precious resource for the world of wine. And we need to make sure that we are aware of what we have so that we don't recklessly lose material that actually could really help us in the future, especially in a time of climate change. And genetic diversity is resilience. And the genetic erosion of agricultural crops is a concern that's very active across all agriculture, not just wine. So we seek to convey the relevance of, of, vi of old vines, um, which are often low yielding, the quality of the wines, agricultural heritage, economic and social significance, and future proofing of genetic diversity. That's sort of in a nutshell what we're here to do. All of this information is on our website, so I'm not going to talk too much about the people and, and uh, the detail of our activities because my colleague Belinda is going to pull, up, pull that up at the end. But essentially, it can seem like an esoteric or geeky way to talk about wine, but what we have seen is that if you can work together to talk about wine in this way, to talk about viticulture in this way, it's enormously evocative and engaging. So just from us, uh, from our perspective as a nonprofit, we started in 2021 and we've seen the most incredible response. I must say at this stage, of course, that we were not the first people to care about old vines. And there are some extremely important and impactful organisations who've been working at a local, regional or national level. And where we come in is that we kind of help to join that up. So on to the detail of old vineyards. How old is old? There is a minimum qualifying vine age, which is not consistent across the world. So there is no unified legal definition of old vines. That's the first thing to say. I think we could do with one, but for me, the most important thing is that we continue to raise awareness of the value of this category. I 
I'm against legislating too early. I think it stifles the innovation and community building that you need for this kind of project. But just to give you an idea, these are the minimum qualifying buying ages that are stipulated by a number of collectives. So the way that these organizations apply this minimum stipulation is that they work as memberships with a sort of share charter. So in order to join, for example, the South African Old Vine Project, which has a minimum vine age of 35 years, you have to agree to abide by the member charter and provide the evidence of the age of your vines. That's actually the way that most of these organizations work. So there isn't there's no sort of external imposed law. It's about groups of like minds who care about this saying, let's work together and let's make this sort of fellowship and a, a kind of a pledge that we keep to each other. So that's the case in South Africa, um, Barossa in Australia, uh, Maule in Chile, uh, Lodi in the USA. Now, what we're starting to see in Spain is that the use of old vine terminology of a designation has actually started to be taken into the Consejo Regulador um, legalities um, regulations. So, for example, in Priorat, if you want to call your, your wine an old vine wine, you have to be able to specify um, that it is at least 70 years old, the vine age is at least 70 years old, um, and you have to be able to prove it. And in Rioja, for the uh, new Vinejo, uh, Vinero Singulares, there's also a minimum vine age of 35 if you want to claim that old vine designation. So you may be thinking, because I thought the same, 30 or 35 doesn't sound that old. We know that there are vineyards all around the world that are actually much older than that. And indeed, they're often the most striking and romantic and evocative vineyards. So why 35? I think it's very important to go through the, the validation, the, the justification for having that as a minimum age. So around 35 years of age, is when you start to see physiologically in the vine the rewards of age, which are a more expansive root system with everything that means for the resilience, for the um, absorption of water, nutrients, for the physical sort of stability of the vine. You also have an increased woody girth. So the literally the woodiness of the vine and around 30, 35 years of age is when this starts to become significant for vines because that carbohydrate reserve, which is stored in the wood, is the energy that vines use for their reproductive purposes when the growing season. It's, it's the kind of the, it, it's their fuel <laughs> for getting going in the, in the new season. So if you have a vine with just this woody girth, it can look even even if the the sort of the the trunk can look a little bit, you know, um, dry or you know gnarled. There is carbohydrate reserve being stored in that mass, and this gives the vines well, just this sense of added strength and resilience. There is also as vines get to around this age what has been posited as uh, an optimal level of epigenetic adaptation. So epigenetic adaptation refers to RNA changes in the vine as a result of stresses or just in, um, sort of um, the environment in which it is growing and living and metabolizing. And essentially, through the sort of methylation process of the um, RNA, you get a, a genetic change. So this is, it's, I mean, uh, botanists <laughs> don't talk like this, but there's, you can always think of it as the vine starts to build up like a memory. So the 1920 Barossa drought 
if you've got um, a 150-year-old vine, it is very likely, and it has, the research has been done, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that the vine basically has adapted to this and has held that adaptation. Now, many of these epigenetic adaptations can be passed on to offspring. It's the same with humans, by the way. Humans also have epigenetic adaptation to our environment, um, to our lifestyles, to what we eat, etc. And some of those adaptations, some of those changes in your in your, um, you know, DNA, actually can be passed on. So this is why you have this growing interest in taking cuttings from old vines because they have basically they they kind of learned lessons which have been permanently absorbed into their genome, which can be passed on. The Australians call taking cuttings from such old vines, taking heritage cuttings, and they're highly prized. The other thing about getting to this sort of 30, 35 year old um, age is that you typically have a lower photosynthetic rate in older vines. Why is that beneficial? It's beneficial for optimal berry composition. And there is evidence that older vines have lower pH and higher TA, tartaric acidity, than a comparable vine, same variety, same site from younger vines. And younger vines are more anisohydric. Um, risk taking. So essentially, this means that they they will um, keep their stoma in the leaves open, um, and they'll um, you know it's almost like a puppy <laughs> racing around. You know, so the younger younger vines have this behavior, this response of basically really kind of going for it, and therefore taking up um, and wanting to use more water. Um, and this is also obviously then linked into all the other aspects of berry composition. So this is why this sort of 30, 35 year old is a key, um, a, a key cutting off point. There's also a practical consideration, which is that Rosa Kruger, the, the great pioneer and visionary really of old vine heritage in South Africa, also highlights that it's around 30 to 35 years that a lot of modern vineyards had been built in with the kind of an assumption of senescence at 30 to 35 years. So let's put it in, um, let's work the vines hard, we'll have intensive um, high density planting, probably lots of irrigation, um, and all of those things actually mean that by 30 years some vineyards especially if you start with that mentality, are actually ready to be, um, you know, they're exhausted. They have to be given up. Um, and certainly the South Africans have seen from observing healthy old vines that there are lessons to be learned in planting to grow old for the future. And they're taking lots of lessons in pruning, vine health, vineyard establishment that have been modelled on the naturally healthy long lives and, and resilience that they observe in these old vineyards. So I wanted to focus on some of the evidence and research that at the Old Vine Conference, we've been very fortunate to learn from. So the Old Vine Conference, we run field trips, tastings, and um, community workshops. We also hold online, conferences. So we hold several conferences a year. And I all of these conferences, by the way, you can watch live online via the links at our website, oldvines.org. We have the most incredible speakers who give their time and their expertise for free so that they can basically build to this, build this level of knowledge in our wine community about the value of old vineyards. So I wanted to just highlight a particular session we had from Professor and um, from Dr. Dylan Grigg. Dylan Grigg is an Australian and he is a consultant viticulturalist and winemaker. And he completed his uh, thesis, his doctoral thesis on 
probably I would say the, the currently the most extensive research into effects of grapevine age and you can watch his full presentation from our website at um the at the old vine conference but essentially what what um dr dylan grigg did was over several vintages he established um a controlled experiment um, he actually he won the special um, prize from the University of Adelaide for this uh, for this research, and he was looking at Shiraz in the Barossa, and he also had a control in the Eden Valley, and he was able to have lots of controls in the sense same variety, very um, similar terroir, um, and. A, a statistically significant difference in vine age. And this was a project that was carried out over several years and several vintages. And it went all the way through from vineyard, observation of vine physiology um, and analysis of all the aspects of vine physiology. So canopy, um, transpiration, um, uh, you know, trunk girth, um, all the aspects of vine physiology, aspects of the vine life cycle, so the phenology of the vine, what was happening when, uh, all analysed um, within this frame of um, statistically significantly different vine ages, berry composition, sensory analysis and composition into all the key components of great berry, um, of, of of, of the great berries, and then also micro vinifications with a standardized winemaking over three vintages and sensory analysis of wine and also the analytical composition of wine. So a very thorough study. There are there have other studies have been done on what difference does grapevine age make and Again, from our website, oldvines.org, we have a page of resources there, which links to all of these. And also you can view Dylan's full presentation on our YouTube channel, which again is linked to from our website. So um, a little bit about the sort of the basis really of, of this research, which I think is, uh, the reason I've chosen this research is because we wanted to, go like beyond the basics of old vineyards. And this research is, I would say, the most rounded and comprehensive that looks at the effect of vine age on the vine. So the Barossa um, has really championed its old vines. So I know we talk about Australia as a new world country for wine. I, to be honest with you, I hate the term new world and old world. I think it's, you know, it may be new to, to someone, but from their point of view, you know, they have a wine industry dating back to the 1700s, which is intimately interwoven. The same with, um, of course, um, the USA as well. You know, you have incredible um, ancient viticultural heritage, of course, going right back to the you know the 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 Spanish missionaries, and then of course with the, the waves of um, of um, immigration and so on, and establishment by the Italian community for a start. But anyway, Barossa, Australia, they realised that their old vine heritage was a real asset. There is a backstory here because there was a deep sense of grief and regret in Barossa of the vine cool program of the 1980s when a lot of the really old vineyards that had been first established in the Barossa by the predominantly the German and Silesian immigrants had been ripped up um, and talking here about um, Riesling um, and Shiraz and it was it was sort of seen as a kind of improvement it, there, because this concept of these vineyards being a type of agricultural heritage and a sort of a genetic resource is something that we've woken up to quite late in wine. So Barossa had gone through this vine pool scheme. They 
kind of stopped it just in time. And then driven by um, initially a couple of producers who decided they really wanted to champion this heritage, they started with its old vine charter and I think very beautifully communicated hierarchy. I think this is a smart wine marketing, wine marketing and, and authentic marketing in comms. So you have old vine, survivor vine, centenarian vine and ancestor vine. So nice tier, very clear um, demarcation. And this charter was then taken up and expanded across the Barossa and the Australians are now working with each other within different regions to basically take this and expand it across different regions of Australia so that you'll have a sort of a unified charter um, for the old vineyards of all the different regions in Australia where it exists. So for example, the Hunter, for example. So um, the Australians are helped in this by the existence of really meticulously kept records. And this is one of the issues we have in, in the kind of old vine communities. How do you know? Because you can't do dendro chronology. You, know, you can't count the rings on a vine because it doesn't create them because it's not a tree, it's a liana. So that's one of the challenges we have is that it has to be verified um, uh, by documentation. The South Africans also had excellent documentation. Otherwise, it's a kind of an element of interpretation. Some of the vineyards in Spain, for example, that are down as being 70 years old are probably much older than that. It's just that it was 70 years ago that they were first sort of logged. So just um, within that, I just wanted to give that context of what, you know, Dr. Dylan Grigg choosing to do this study as an Australian viticulturalist, he's invested and engaged with this old vine, um, this old vine value. So these are all clips from Dylan's presentation, but for me, I just find this such a great entry into getting your head around why why bother? Why is it why did vine age matter? What does it do to the vine? So his study looked at um canopy, fruit, um, wine, and then molecular genetic analysis. This is where the epigenetic findings that I was talking about a few slides earlier. Um, this is where this came in. Um, we don't have time to go through it all. And indeed, the best thing to do is watch this, watch Dylan tell you about the study in his own words, which you can do on our YouTube channel. But essentially, the reason I also wanted to bring in this slide is because, of course, it's wine is always a nexus of factors. There's so many aspects that intersect to make wine how it is that vine age, of course, it's not so absolute as to say, you know, a wine from 200 year old vines is going to taste oh, better than a wine from, you know, 30 year old vines. We know it's always this intersection of factors. So in, in this study, um, Dr. Greg also looked at the interaction with terroir. So Eden Valley and Barossa Valley, Eden Valley, of course, higher ev elevation, uh, cooler climate um, and a more rainy, um, uh, right, more rainy climate as well. So his study, Dylan's study was interesting because his study showed that there, is, there was not an inevitable catastrophic loss of yield in old vines. This is often a, a statement that we see around old vines. We say, you know, it, and, and it's kind of become a truism, but it's actually not necessarily the case. Yes, you can see a reduction in yield as vines age, especially if the vines have, um, you know, have struggled, if they, for example, been really hard pruned, um, and if perhaps they're, they're not in the best of health, as vines get older, you can have this really severe loss of yield. But in fact, especially in vineyards which have been planted to grow old and in this quite traditional way where the vine is given space, it's given so much space to accumulate its woody reserves, that actually there is not then necessarily a loss in yield. 
these stars here represent statistical significance. Um, and the green bars are the findings from the old vines and the blue bars are the findings from the young vines. He had in his, Dylan had in his study, an average difference in vine age of 98 years. So a significantly um, wide vine age, um, difference in vine age. And as you'll see in here, fruit mass and yield, there was actually a very slightly higher yield from the old vines. Something that we have seen in our ongoing research and work with old vineyards is that the consideration and the study, the observation of healthy old vineyards has led to a complete reevaluation of pruning orthodoxy. And this is in the context of this huge surge in fungal, di fungal diseases that have really afflicted many wine regions. So Esca, Utipa, and so on. And these fungal diseases are associated with pruning cuts and the wounds that you can get from pruning and the calluses that form inside the vine that stop the, zap, the sap flow. And another speaker we've had at the Old Vine Conference is um, Marco Simonit of Simonit and Serka, who are uh, master pruners and uh, they are in this kind of community of really expert viticulturalists who are leading this charge to say look we have to look again about how we prune and it's 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 often just simplified as called soft pruning but this is really interesting Dylan makes the point in more detail in his presentation that if you look at the these old vineyards that he's working with they are enormous structures. You know, these vines have been able to spread and spread and take up their space. And it's this that has made them resilient and strong. And if vines are allowed to almost embrace their liana nature, their climbing, spreading nature, they can absolutely continue to grow, to produce fruit and to produce very high quality fruit at economically sustainable levels for many, many years. A little bit of sensory analysis on the berry that came out of Dylan's research. So old vine berries, higher acidity um, and a, a certain um, sort of more nuanced mouthfeel, more red fruit. fruit. So this is all, these are all sort of attributes that I would describe as a sense of vitality. And indeed, when I taste old vine wine it's this sense of vitality this like crackling energy that I so often find coming through even of course though there's so many different styles of old vine wine there's not an old vine flavor it's more like the light in someone's eyes I would say I mean this is me not being scientific but the scientific outcome is acidity red fruit mouthfeel and then young vine berries uh, were characterized in sensory analysis, sweetness and dried fruit flavor. Now, some, um, some aspects of um, composition showed a clear statistically significant differentiation between old vine and young vine. Actually, I wanted to show this as a kind of caveat because what this slide um, shows is that um, the some aspects are more influenced by um, sight than vine age. And this, this um, slide here actually refers to the two different sites. So these are the Eden Valley sites. These are the Barossa sites. And here that essentially this slide shows that the influence of terroir was stronger than the influence of vine age when it came to the tannin composition analysis of the finished wine. All the wines were made in a standardized way, by the way, so that the, they were trying to keep it as, as um, controlled and um, similar as possible. So um, again, just to, to summarize, vine age is complex, is linked to terroir, 
Uh, it is possible to have some sensory discrimination of qualities that did come through in their blind tasting. And there's so much we still need to learn. There's a lot we still need to learn about the epigenetic and the RNA gene expression. And this is um, a great picture here of one of these old vines. I mean, and it it just has been allowed to get so strong and you can imagine the reserves in here. Um, so that's that's in a nutshell why vine age is not just a fanciful, romantic, picturesque attribute for vines. It is absolutely linked to the physiology, the, um, the life cycle, the growing cycle of the vine. And all of this, of course, then intersects with all the other aspects around wine that make a wine what it is. So cultural practices, the human element of terroir, the specificity of varieties to place, and how you get this intersection between variety, place, people, a style that responding to the challenge of climate, etc. So where are the old vines around the world? Well, one of the issues we have is that we actually don't have a full comprehensive diary, a full comprehensive listing yet. But we work, we were fortunate to be able to partner with some amazing talent in the wine industry and Jantis Robinson, Master of Wine and Tamlin Curran, inspired by the work really of Rosa Kruger in South Africa, about 10 years ago, Jantis Robinson started keeping with her team an Excel spreadsheet of a list of old vineyards from around the world. They also took the minimum of 35 years as a, uh, a vine age. And then when we came along last year, we found that the spreadsheet had got bigger and bigger. I mean, if you ever tried to keep data going on a spreadsheet, you'll know what a nightmare it can be once you've got, you know, to a thousand re records. But essentially, thanks to support from uh, Jackson Family Wines, who gave us a bequest, we were able to set up a, a cloud database um, led by Alda Yarrow, who's uh, whose other sort of expertise is in software development. And we have this old vine registry, which is free to use. It's free for um, vineyards to be submitted. It goes through a moderation process, which is run by volunteers. And we're using this as a way to start to know exactly what we've got and where it is. The, so this is really the beginning, you know, we're really at the, the frontier of establishing the value and the scope of this incredible resource. We now have over 3000 vineyards from 35 countries. If you are working in wine in whatever country, and please do have a look at the old vine registry and encourage those of your contacts, maybe your producers, if you're working in importers, maybe your your wine merchant to have a look at the registry and to submit old vineyards that they are aware of. And we really need this kind of to be built because it helps us. It helps us establish where we are, establish the scale and so on. Um, we worked with Wine Gord, uh, David Morrison, who's a data geek, and he had a look at where what the what the registrations on the old vine registry could start to teach us. So this is why it's useful. So here we have, um, for example, um, uh, just some analysis on where our listings from Italy are, as on the old vine registry, the size of the planting, and then the age of the vines. So here you can see we have quite a significant planting of um, it looks like 125 year old vines. Since we did these analyses, actually, you see in this US, the US, we've got some really good registrations here. Since we've um, done these analyses, the database, the registry since has grown 
You can see here in Portugal, this is why I'm referring to about the record keeping. It looks like there was a big planting in, of, in a, you know, a 50 year old and then um, previously one at 100 years. Some of these are to do with the keeping of records and like when censuses were taken and so on. But you can see why this is valuable. Having this information helps us to to advocate for solutions and to inspire people to to know what we have um, and and to help to keep it in the ground. Um, so again, we can um, share that in fish information a bit more with in more detail if um, if you'd like to see that his analysis uh, it's it's on um wine gourd blogspot and i believe that is linked from our website but i'll check for my colleague belinda so a case study of why this matters spain so spain has got probably more old vines than anywhere else in europe portugal is is still holding on to a lot of its old vines especially in the south because it's kind of escaped the modernization but just it's really highlighted to me how many of our Spanish members were really keen that we understood that they are kind of they're the, like the last bastion fighting to stop this loss of vineyards. So Elias Lopez Montero, fantastic wine maker in La Mancha. Honestly, you would never believe I would never expecting in a million years to have one of my wines of the year come from La Mancha, but he's working with really old vine, Aren, sensational wine. Um, but his point, Elias's point, is that um there's a real loss of older, the proportion of vineyards being comprised of older vines in his um in his denomination. Juan Carlos Santa, does anyone know his wine? Sensational Rioja. He's also a professor and a lecturer in viticulture and a researcher at, um, at Logroño University. And his point here is the evolution of hectares of vineyards planted before 1980 um, in Rioja. So the, the proportion of vineyards um, comprised of older vines has been decreasing in Rioja. He's been really among this movement to halt this and just to raise awareness that in these old vineyards is a kind of germplasm. It's a genetic repository that needs to be valued. Um, so Pablo Rubio, very famous figure in uh, Rivera del Duero. Um, they, they, there's also this concern that they are losing their um their old vine um composition their old vine heritage but i think the the important thing is that people are now having this conversation um and they want to halt this because there's more and more evidence of the value of these vineyards even if it's just as genetic arcs that alone is reason enough to keep them or at least to do some analysis and to keep cuttings before they're lost forever. We at the Old Vine Conference, we host field trips and we take wine professionals and students to old vineyards where we have a small conference and we really focus and at, on, we focus on the, the projects that are being done with old vines in, in that particular zone. So this is a, a photograph of really old vines in Rioja Alavesa, spectacular, spectacular terroir, amazing wines coming out of Rioja Alavesa. And they have this very old vineyard in which they found 37 Benedicto vines, which is one of the parents of um, Tempranillo. And this has been this incredible project led by uh, Ruben, their viticulturalist, and they found a further 30 varieties that have been on their land for um, at least a hundred years. Um, and they've been going through this process of identifying, taking cuttings, recuperating, and making sure these old vines can be brought back into health and production, which they, they can. And then they planted this experimental vineyard to preserve this germplasm. And all of this resource is being shared and the research is being shared with their, their um, colleagues and fellow producers. 
A little word of caution from the great um, Alvaro Palacios. Wine from an old vine in the wrong place offers no better quality than a young vine in a fantastic location. However, if everything coincides, old vines give us the very best, something fascinating due to the mystery that they carry inside, what I call the wisdom of old vines. And I think I will always stand up for saying, you know, there's an, of course, wine is science, it's agriculture, but it's also an element of transcendence. You know, this is why humans create and drink wine together. It's an element of uh, being something bigger than just its parts. And I think we have to allow for that when we talk about the value of old vineyards in wine. It's that transcendent something when everything comes together. And if, frankly, if it's good enough for Alvaro, it's good enough for me. Um, so this is why we do what we do. We're a nonprofit. Um, I volunteer a certain amount of my time every month. We'd love to hear from people who want to work with us, whatever you could you can do. Um, we, are, we have an amazing network of regional ambassadors. My fantastic colleague Belinda runs our press office, but just to say, you know, this, this is evocative, it is powerful. So if anyone watching is working in the trade or in sales, just bear in mind, this is a way of communicating about wine and farming of wine, which can be extremely powerful and the value can be realized. The South Africans have proved that with research that they did into onto their marketing side, which showed the, the, the seal that they have, their old wine seal on their bottles raised the perceived value among target consumers by up to 30%. And they've seen this transformation in the affluence of grape farmers working with old, old vineyards through this raised value, leading to higher grape prices being paid and very fine, properly valued wine being made. Just some of the people that we partner with, Wine Scholar Guild is our educational partner. We're enormously grateful. We love the ethos and the spirit of Wine Scholar Guild and the whole community that you have. It's a really an honor for us to be able to come and speak with you. And of course, um, the Old Wine Registry, Janice Robinson's Wine Writing Competition, the IWSC Trophy. We have an Old Wine Trophy for gold medal vines that come through and that are also then made from um, uh, old vines. Um, and we're also delighted we do partner with Zap Zinfandel Advocates and Producers. So we're delighted to have that connection in the States. Um, so I think um, we, we're going to have a, some Q&A and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Belinda to talk about the, the sort of our, the programme. <laughs> Um, so should we have, should we go through the, uh, the questions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, first of all, Sarah, thank you so much. That was such a, an enlightening webinar and like you, you make a pretty compelling case about why we need to be looking after this kind of irreplaceable resource. So thank you. It was really fascinating. I think for me, I found, I mean, a couple of things on there really enlightening. I mean, first of all, I had no idea that a vine's genetic as it changes the genetic uh, change that it undergoes could actually be passed on to the next generation that was really fascinating i also had no idea that that, that you couldn't count rings on a vine because it's a liana and so it makes it aging it so difficult so that's a that's a that, that was a really good thing to know but i mean for me the most the, the most telling thing was that you know there's always this pervading myth um that vines once they get over a certain age become commercially unviable and that research kind of blows that myth out of the water you know if you're in the right place and you're given like you were saying the right amount of space that actually doesn't necessarily lead to a to a loss of yield so that was really fascinating so thank you um we have had some questions from members um if you have any more then now's the time to pop them into our uh, our chat box but um the first question we had was um from Bart, who asks that um, since the vines in Barossa are on their own roots, can the characteristics of the old vine be passed on um, to new vine plantings by using provenage, um, which I guess yes. is, uh, is like layering, is it, I think? Yes, it is. Exactly. Yes, Bart, they can. And certain varieties are easier to do that with. 
because they want to lay down. <laughs> they want to have, and, and in fact, with some of these really old vines, and in fact, on Dylan's presentation, he has a whole section on provenage. Um, I'm, I think it's, um, so in your chat, I, uh, it's um, P-R-O-V-I-G-N-A-G-A. -A. That's the spelling. Um, and it's also known as layering. But yes, they do use that um, that system. And then I can see. Shall I? Shall I just? Shall I just romp through the questions and and answer? yes. Well, I'll read them out because um, yeah. uh, members can't actually see these questions. So I'll, I'll just put them to you. Oh, but Matt has asked um, in the context of epigenetics. I certainly wish I had got you to read it out now. Um, what are your thoughts on potential phylloxera resistance for vinifera rootstock um, with exposure over a long enough time frame? It's interesting. Oh, Matt, this is such a prime geeky question. Okay, so. I can't claim them as my thoughts, but I have been fortunate to have some interactions with and, and attend some lectures with um, a professor called uh, Mario Frigoni, who is uh, the most sprightly, I think, 89 year old you're going to meet. He's an Italian viticulturalist and he is the leading researcher on vinifera resistance for ungrafted vines. Now, I haven't come across anything in his presentation that talks about epigenetics being a factor. It's more about management and um, and uh, kind of management practices um, and site. But um, Matt, I have, which I was just sent um, actually, just on Monday, I've got a whole stack of information from Professor Fregoni. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm very happy to share it. He said I can share it, but there may well be some information on there, whether there is where epigenetic adaptation is possible to resist phylloxera. My instinct is why not? Um, you know, we do know that some it is there are vineyards that do manage being infested with phylloxera but it's a bit like having you know a um it, you know it's not a it's, it's not like a prognosis for a long life but um in epigenetics i don't know but i um, there is an interaction of the old vine community with this interest in um ungrafted and rootstock alternative uh, community. Thank you. And then the last one that we've got um, is from Harsha, which uh, asks the pictures that you showed in your presentation um, were of old vines that were really spaced up, uh, far apart from each other. Do you know what the average vines per hectare of old vines are versus other vines, or will it vary greatly from region to region? Um, we don't have that average figure. I think to gather that would be it would be interesting. It would be an enormous piece of data gathering and uh, sort of moderating. But the 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 observation that really healthy old vineyards are very wide planted. They tend to be widely planted, and um, in relatively dry, you know, not really damp environments. And and harsher, it comes into that point about it needing lots of it's the wood it's the it's given the space to just grow and grow and put on that girth that makes the vine resilient so yes they are spaced um further apart you 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 see that with all these old vineyards and it's because the vine is given that space to do its you know liana climbing spreading thing you're letting you're letting vine be the vine that's how they stay strong and healthy for so long brilliant thank you well um once again sarah thank you so much for such an informative and enlightening presentation before we say goodbye to you um perhaps now would be a good time to welcome belinda back where she can um just introduce you a little bit more to the work that the uh, old vine conference does Thank you, Justin. Um, and thank you, Sarah. That was really interesting. Every time I hear Sarah speak, I learn something new as well. Um, so I've been working with Sarah um, on 
for the Old Vine Conference for the last two years. Um, and the program that you see in front of you there um, has grown significantly um, since I started. We have a, a global campaign and we are funded by um, wineries, mem winery members, trade members, um, and individual membership. And actually, um, I have seen since we've had this uh, session started that a couple of you very lovely people watching at home um, have become members. So thank you so much for your support. Um, everyone has a part to play in the Old Vine movement and in the guardianship of Old Vines, whether you are actively involved in the work or not. Um, and becoming an individual member of the Old Vine Conference does help to support the work that we do. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, and of course, uh, the Wine Scholar Guild have become our first educational partners um, for which we are extremely grateful. Um, and they have given us this platform to share the work that we do um, and all of Sarah's invaluable insights um, and that of our partners as well. Um, but there, so you can become an individual member that does support uh, the work that we do, but it also gives you um, an insight into what we are doing um, across the year, things that are just flashing up on your screen at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry i thought i'd bring you to your summary <laughs> um but there there are things that you can do for free yeah uh, you can join in the conversation you can become uh you can follow us on instagram uh where a lot of our community are based um and you can be kept up to date with everything that we're doing following us at our old vines um, our website, as Sarah has mentioned a few times, is uh, oldvines.org. You can view all of our virtual conferences on there and our workshops. Um, and if you sign up to receive our e-newsletter, you will be uh, among the first to hear about the programme and the release dates of any uh, events and activities that we are hosting. Um, we have in-person tastings as well. We, as a team, um, are based mainly in the UK. We do have regional ambassadors around the world um, and we have a very active membership in Italy where we will be hosting some in-person events uh, over there. But a lot of our in-person events at the moment happen in the UK um, and mainly in London. We will be holding um, our Old Vine Conference annual trade tasting on the 19th of June at 67 Pall Mall, um, and you can sign up to receive all the information about attending that uh, when it uh, is launched. We also have just started um, recording uh, an Old Vine Conference podcast, uh, which you can get on all of your podcast providers, all the usual ones, um, and launch today. We would be very grateful for um, any of your nominees for the Old Vine Hero Awards 2024. Um, and you can find details of that um, on our Instagram page at the moment with links to the nomination page. So if you are working with Old Vines or you know someone who is working with Old Vines and you would like their work recognised by our team of expert uh, Old Vine judges, then um, the nomination form has just opened today and will close on the 21st of February. So you've got two weeks to get nominations in for that. And as Sarah already said, one of the most valuable pieces of work that we have done in the last year or so is to uh, digitalize the old vine registry with uh, the people that, that Sarah's already mentioned. Um, and uh, any old vines that you have visited or are aware of with wineries you've uh, come across, please do give them our link, uh, the link to oldvineregistry.org, or please do submit the information onto the website directly yourself uh, so that we can make um, the, the world's most comprehensive database of living old vines available for everybody to use. Um, and that's it, really. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. Um, you can reach me if you want to at belinda at oldvines.org. Um, and uh, Sarah's details, uh, you can reach her via, via me um, or through our Instagram page, uh, as you can see there. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share the work that we do with you. Um, I'll pass you back to Justin and Sarah.
Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's been an absolute um, joy, an absolute privilege to hear about the work that you guys are doing with such verve and commitment. So um, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, just a final note to members, I will upload the recording of this webinar um, uh, this evening. Is it six o'clock here? Um, uh, but I'll also include a PDF of Sarah's presentation. So if you didn't get a chance to catch all of the contact details and things like that, you'll find it on our studio page just next to the recording. It'll have a download PDF version. Um, and so you can you can follow and, and, and um, get involved with the Old Vine Conference as much as you like. So um, thank you, members, for joining us. A final thank you to um, Sarah and Belinda for um, sharing the work that, that you do. And um, we will see you next time. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.